Good afternoon, everybody. I am Brett Squarenton from Miller Johnson, and welcome to our webinar today on one of my favorite topics, ESG and ERISA. I always try to be a little bit dramatic. The, the basic point here is, uh, for those of you who don't know, ESG has become a very live issue in the culture wars, if you will, has become very politicized. Uh, and I'm going to try to walk through where we've been, where we're going, and give some final concluding thoughts. Um, okay, here's a lineup for today. What are we talking about for those who are not familiar with ESG and ERISA? I don't want to assume that people on this webinar are already experts, if you will. Uh, I wanted this to be accessible to you know, regular lay people. Um, where has this issue been up to the state? Um, what is the, the new developments? What is coming down the road, at least in my hazy crystal ball? And how do I think people who are in charge of managing ERISA plans should respond to the latest on um, these topics? Hopefully we can do some questions. Again, I, I do think I'm gonna run a little bit long, so that might not happen. But um, you should know I am very, very much available. If you want to give me a phone call, if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to talk and do the best I can to help. I also have other colleagues at the Miller Johnson Benefits Department who are very, very happy to help as well. So let's get moving. Housekeeping. I, I just want everybody to know um, I am very invested in these issues. Personally, I spent a lot of time and energy in my last job. I was working at the Department of Labor. Um, working on the Trump ESG rule. So that's that's why I'm so fired up on this stuff, but I'm trying to, I will try not to be biased, but uh, I wanted people to know that's that's the background I'm coming from. Um, I also wanna make sure people understand there are certain things that are totally not gonna be discussed today, even though you may think so hearing the title of the, the webinar. First of all, we're talking about ESG and ERISA. ERISA is a very specific statute, venerable, um, but ERISA regulates private retirement plans. So think pensions, think 401ks. It does not regulate public sector retirement plans. So if any of you guys are involved in a public sector retirement plan, ERISA does not concern you. The, the Trump and the Biden rules that we will discuss today have no bearing on, on what you have to do. So you can, you can rest easy. Um, we're also not talking about people who are just doing their own investing in the stock market um, using any other investment vehicles. This only refers to ERISA plans that are sponsored by uh, an employer. Neither am I talking about whether or not I think or you should think ESG investing is a good idea or a bad idea. I'm only talking about what the law of ERISA says about ESG in retirement plans. And finally, there may there may be some of you who are curious about what the SEC is doing on ESG. It is a huge topic. They are likely to have a big rule on climate disclosures released soon. That is also off limits. I will not be discussing that today. Okay. Um, I do have the, the Q&A window open. If any of you have questions on the way, I will do my best to try to keep tabs on that. Again, if I don't get to it, please send me an email, give me a call, and I'm happy to happy to help. Okay, background on ERISA and ESG. So ERISA is almost 40, sorry, almost 50 years old. It was passed in 1974. There had been some really tragic instances of companies that had gone under and people lost basically all of their pensions. Um, mostly retirement was pensions back then. Um, so Congress stepped in and they applied very strict standards for people who are managing retirement savings of private sector workers, their spouses, their families. Um, and the law on this topic is, is pretty intense. Some courts have even said that the standards ERISA created are the highest standards known to law. And I'm gonna talk briefly about the two standards most at play when we're discussing ESG. Um, the duty of loyalty and the duty of prudence. These are, these are not, um, ideas that come from ERISA, they actually are, are older than that. They come out of the common law, but Congress, when they passed ERISA, incorporated these duties into um, the laws governing retirement plans. So the duty of loyalty, as you may expect, says that if you are a fiduciary, if you are managing retirement assets for your employees, you have to put their interests first. 
In fact, more than putting their interests first, they those interests are the only interests you can consider. So I'm quoting, I'm quoting from the language of the statute here. Fiduciaries are required to act, quote, solely in the interest of the participants and beneficiaries of the plan and for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to participants and their beneficiaries. Um, you guys probably know there is a ton of money in retirement plans. Um, I believe it's about $10 trillion. And anytime there are large pots of money, there are temptations because we are all human beings to use that money for maybe purposes that are not intended. Arissa was trying to say, you can't touch this money unless you are only seeking the good of the people who are in the plan. Um, and the Supreme Court helpfully clarified, though I don't think anybody was surprised, in a unanimous decision about 10 years ago, it's called Dudenhofer, that when we talk about those benefits, uh, you see the, the language of Arissa uses the term benefits that refers to financial benefits, not other benefits. They use the, the phrase non-pecuniary, which we'll be visiting a little bit later. Uh, the second key duty that ERISA adopted for retirement plans is the duty of prudence. So this refers to needing to act prudently, needing to act like a professional who knows what he or she is doing, who considers the relevant options, makes informed decisions. Um, the, the statute describes it as acting with, quote, the care, skill, prudence, and diligence under the circumstances, then prevailing that a prudent man acting in a like capacity and familiar with such matters would use in the conduct of an enterprise of a like character and with like aims. This is also sometimes described as the duty of care if you listen to the discussions about ERISA. Now, ESG, again, I don't want to assume anybody knows ESG. I've talked to many, many colleagues here who are encountering the term for the first time. Um, it's, it's been around a while, but it's still a little bit new. It stands for environmental, social, and governance investing. And it is a, a broad umbrella term for an investment strategy that in some sense takes those factors into account. Um, as you probably know, those are, those are all each very broad categories. I'd say that the most common, the most prominent, uh, factor that goes into this is climate change. I, I think that's the most frequently considered idea when people talk about ESG, but ESG can talk about pretty much anything. Um, the S for social, for instance, that can refer to the, uh, the diversity of a board, or the diversity of the workforce. It can refer to um, an employee, employer's employment practices, um, how they treat labor unions. So this, this really captures all kinds of things. Um, that are not necessarily strictly related to financial matters. Um, it's part of a long movement um, going back, you know, decades. I don't think the term has been around since maybe the early aughts, um, but older versions of, of this same idea are socially responsible investing, SRI, uh, ethical investment, economically targeted investing, um, impact investing. So you hear different, different things. The label is not frankly, very precise. That's that's part of the problem when you try to um, incorporate it with ERISA. So that's my last bullet. Um, people use ESG differently. Um, the, the most important difference for our purposes is some people say, I'm going to invest taking into account environmental, social, and governance factors because I think that is a more sophisticated version of investing and that will help me identify other risks that are not typically considered. And by taking into those risks, taking into account those risks, I can actually bring about a higher return or reduce the risk of the investment. That's one kind of ESG. Another kind of ESG, which will still use the same label, um, says, I want to make money with my investing, but I also want to do other good things. I very much care about the environment. I very much care about racial diversity. I care about it so much that it's possible I'm willing to take a cut on the returns I bring in so that I can, you know, accomplish good X, good Y out in the world. Um, that is also described as ESG. And um, the ambiguity in what people mean by ESG, again, is it's part of the challenge when we're applying a, a law with the strict standards of ERISA. Okay, so where have we been in terms of the, the legal and regulatory environment? I'm going to talk a lot about the Department of Labor, the U.S. Department of Labor. Again, that's where I worked uh, before I came to Miller Johnson uh, two years ago. Um, 
the Department of Labor has a, an agency within it. It's called the Employee Benefit Security Administration, EBSA. They are the chief regulator, the chief enforcer of ERISA. Um, now, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's always been pressure. If you have control over a lot of money, you use that money for personal ends. There's, there's always the risk of conflict of interest. And it's, it's almost from the beginning of, of the agency, this has been a concern that they've been addressing. Um, and when I was researching this, I found a very interesting speech that was turned into a journal article from the, I believe the first head of EPSA, it wasn't called EPSA back then, um, who, who tried to kind of deal with these, these, um, these potential conflicts. And, and he, he wrote, economic considerations are the only ones which can be taken into account in determining which investments are consistent with ERISA standards. And he warned, fiduciaries who exclude investments for non-economic reasons would be, quote, acting at their peril. Um, again, so ERISA is designed, at least one of, one of the points ERISA is, if you are one of those people, if you are an ERISA fiduciary, part of your job is investing the money that people are trying to save for retirement. You have to follow very strict standards. And one of the ways those standards apply is what decisions, how do you make decisions about your investing? What factors are you allowed to consider? And that is that is where we come to um, first the guidance and later the, the rulemaking that the Department of Labor is engaged in. Okay, so I'm being a little cheeky here, but it's very much been a, a ping pong um, in terms of the emphases the department has made over the years. Uh, again, the law has not changed. The, the relevant sections of ERISA have not been amended, but beginning in 1994 with some sub-regulatory guidance that was published by the then Clinton DOL, um, there's been different different finessing of the, the fiduciary obligations under ERISA as it relates to ESG or other schools of investing. Um, so 1994 was when there was a first like official guidance on topic. Before that, it had only been uh, private letters that the agency would send to you know various stakeholders with questions. And um, the 1994 guidance, we'll we'll talk more about this later, but they they created for the first time what what has come to be known as the tiebreaker rule. The tiebreaker rule says, or at least said in this 1994 guidance, uh, that when there are competing investments, so a fiduciary is looking at options for how to invest money for the plan. Um, if, if the fiduciary determines that the competing investments serve the plan, would serve the plan equally well, then under this rule, the fiduciary is allowed to use non-financial considerations to in effect break the tie, uh, to be the deciding factor for the decision. Um, again, this is called the tiebreaker rule. The ping pong game uh, continued with guidance in 2008 under the Bush, uh, the second Bush DOL, then in 2015, under the Obama DOL, um, as you probably can imagine, the, the Democratic DOLs are adopting slightly more permissive language for how frequently or in what situations you can consider non-purely financial uh, factors. The, the Republican DOLs are doing the opposite. Um, that said, again, underlying law, ERISA has not amend, been amended on these points. And even in the guidance itself that, that would come out, there has been a fairly strong level of consistency because they always would affirm that fiduciaries cannot accept reduced returns or accept greater risks in order to secure non-financial goals, whether that be environmental policy or, or anything else, whether it be you know, helping your Uncle Joe with his concrete business. Um, can't do that. Okay, so um, President Trump's Department of Labor was the first in the game of ping pong to kind of escalate this from guidance to a rule. And uh, in November of 2020, the Trump administration released the first ESG rule, um, trying to clarify in the face of this growing popularity of ESG investing, how uh, ERISA fiduciaries should consider that um, against the the rules that ERISA lays down. Not everybody's favorite word, but um, the Trump rule lifted from the, the Supreme Court opinion I referenced earlier, the word pecuniary, and decided to make pecuniary kind of the centerpiece of their rule. Pecuniary, if 
for those of you who don't like antiquated English, uh, it just is a fancy way of saying relating to money. It's a synonym with financial. Um, anyway, the Supreme Court used that phrase, so the Trump DOL lifted that for their for their own regulatory standard. Um, in particular, the the Trump DOL decided that ESG as a as a word in a regulation is very unhelpful because of the ambiguities I referenced earlier. Um, to quote from their introduction, ESG is not a clear or helpful lexicon for a regulatory standard because it resists precise definition. Okay, so pecuniary factor, that, that became the centerpiece, the kind of the foundation of the Trump ESG rule and the, the rule defined a pecuniary factor as a factor that a fiduciary prudently determines is expected to have a material effect on the risk and a return of an investment. Again, you could just call this financial. Um, and the core of the rule was that if you are an ERISA fiduciary and you're you know, making investment decisions on behalf of the plan, you may only consider pecuniary factors in making that decision. The Trump administration also narrowed in its in its rule, the tiebreaker rule that I, I talked about earlier from 1994. Um, it said, first of all, that fiduciaries should only rarely use the tiebreaker in their own work, implying that um, at least the Trump DOL was skeptical that ties occur frequently in, in real life. Um, but it said that if you are going to use the tiebreaker rule to make a decision based on an ESG factor, you know, any other factor that's not strictly financial, um, you can only break the tie if you are unable to distinguish the competing investments based on pecuniary factors alone. Basically, you need to give it an honest try. And if you can't make up your mind on which investment would be better for the plan based only on pecuniary factors, then you're allowed to go to this tiebreaker and use a non-pecuniary factor. Um, Another, another new thing the Trump DOL rule did, the Trump ESG rule did, was create an additional rule for default investments in ERISA plans. Again, I don't know if that's something people are familiar with, but um, a lot of people, when they first get their elections to choose their 401k fund at the start of employment, just don't elect a fund. And so you have those contributions automatically go to the default investment. The fancy term for that is a QDIA. Uh, and the Trump rule said that because of this unique character of QDIAs, that they are the money goes into them without any affirmative election or non-election for that matter by the plan participant, that they would apply slightly heightened standards in regards to ESG investments. Um, namely, you would not be allowed to use an ESG investment defined as a investment whose investment objectives or goals or principal investment strategies include and or use non-pecuniary factors. Basically, the idea is if you are a plan participant, we need you to say affirmatively, I want to have my money in an ESG fund before we put your money in an ESG fund without your election. Okay. Um, now, I want to clear up something because this is a very frustrating part of the, the discourse that I see over and over again, especially now that the, the Biden ESG rule is out. The Trump ESG rule did not ban the use of ESG factors when making investment decisions by risk to shows. It did not do that. I see very good journalists who make this mistake even now. Um, what it did say was that if you are going to use an ESG factor as part of your fiduciary decision making, that factor needs to be pecuniary in addition to relating to, you know, the environment, social and governance goals. Okay. Um, as I wrote in this bullet, the rule sought to make clear that ESG factors may be pecuniary and they may be not pecuniary, depending on the facts and circumstances of the investment in question. And if they're not pecuniary, then you can't use them. If they are pecuniary, you can use them, whether or not they're ESG. Um, again, a lot of confusion in the, the discourse on this topic. So I, I wanted to clear that up here. Okay, what is new? What is new first and foremost is the Biden administration upon taking office um, first announced fairly early on, they would not be enforcing the Trump ESG rule. Um, shortly 
Thereafter, they announced or they, they released a proposal to replace the Trump rule. And then just in, this past November, they published their own final ESG rule. Um, the, the proposed rule um, that came out last fall, or excuse me, last 2021, um, so about a year and a half ago, had a, a more aggressive reading um, on permissibility of ESG factors. The, the language in the reg text as proposed would have said that um, fiduciary's consideration of investments may often require, may often require, that's the key phrase, consideration of ESG factors. Um, and that phrase, although it's not technically a mandate, it was interpreted by many people as a, a soft mandate that could be used to kind of put the thumb on the scale and sort of require fiduciaries to, to look at ESG factors. So there's a lot of pushback from that on the rule, uh, on the proposed rule. Generally, not generally, historically, the Department of Labor does not say any particular kind of investment or category of investment is good or bad or lawful or unlawful, that there is there is discretion for fiduciaries to make their own judgment. Again, assuming that they are following the, the duties of prudence and the duties of loyalty. And uh, for the, the world of ERISA attorneys and ERISA practitioners, this was just, for, for many of them, not all of them, I don't want to put words in people's mouths. For many of them, this was too close to the, the line of, of saying, this is something that needs to be considered when ESG, sorry, EBSA, DOL has historically been neutral on specific kinds or categories of investment. Um, big picture, however, uh, the Biden ESG rule and the Trump ESG rule are broadly similar. And, you know, I think that's not a surprise because, again, the, the law hasn't changed. Um, the language of ERISA is the same. And the language of ERISA is pretty, is pretty stringent. Um, again, agencies can only push out regulations that are interpretations or com compliance with, with the statutory text. And again, there's my position is there's not a ton of wiggle room in the statutory text to, to veer one way or the other via regulation or guidance for that matter. Um, the biggest change that may often require language that I mentioned on the last slide and that got a lot of pushback, that was dropped. So uh, the Department of Labor is staying consistent with its prior approach that we don't explicitly put a thumb on the scale for any kind of investment or investment consideration. Um, so here's how the, the Biden ESG rule describes kind of the core fiduciary duty as it relates to ESG. Fiduciaries may but are not required to consider ESG factors. Now, and here's the quote from the, the regulation itself. Risk and return factors may include the economic effects of climate change and other environmental, social, or governance factors on the particular investment. And the Biden rule drops the pecuniary and non-pecuniary language that I think few were sad to see go. Okay, here's a chart that kind of lays out the, the big, I'd say the four big categories, maybe three and a half um, of the differences between the, the Biden rule and the Trump rule. Again, I would argue if you look at these columns, there's daylight, but it's not a lot of daylight and there's, there's a lot of similarity, but so as we discussed, the Trump rule said you can only invest on the basis of pecuniary factors. The pecuniary factors can be ESG. They just, it's not a guarantee that an ESG factor is pecuniary. Biden says you can consider ESG factors if they, quote, reasonably determine that the factor is relevant to a risk and return analysis. Again, reasonably determine that factor is relevant to a risk and return analysis and pecuniary factor. If you looked at the definition in the Trump rule, not a huge difference. Again, not identical, but not a huge difference. Um, the tiebreaker rule, if you recall, the Trump rule said you can't break a tie unless a fiduciary in his or her best efforts can't break the tie based only on pecuniary factors. And then it also said if you are going to use a non-pecuniary factor, such as an ESG factor, to break the tie, you have to have some documentation to show why you did that. The Biden ESG rule returns the tiebreaker rule basically to where it was in that 1994 guidance that first introduced the concept, not as stringent, um, doesn't use the unable to distinguish language, just says when a competing investment serves the plan's interest equally well. It also removed any documentation requirement. The Biden rule dropped the QDIA um, extra standards that the, the Trump rule had. Um, 
the same fiduciary standards apply to QDIAs under the Biden rule as any other investment or choice for a, a menu on a 401k. Um, now, I didn't discuss this earlier, but a big question that fiduciaries have, and very understandably so, how can they handle and take into account participants, employees who come to them and say, you know, I would really like to invest my 401k in an ESG fund. I care very much about this issue. Um, and to what extent can a fiduciary say, hey, I'm hearing from employees, they want this. Can that be a factor as I consider how to construct our retirement plan? The Trump rule said, yes, you can take participant preferences into account, but only if it's an ESG, excuse me, only if it's a tiebreaker, as in you have competing investments, say you have a, you know, a, a 401k for a particular asset class, there's a, a non-ESG version and an ESG version, and you can't honestly see a difference between them only on pecuniary grounds. The Biden, excuse me, the Trump rule said you can break the tie in that case by saying, I'm hearing a lot from employees that they want this option. The Biden rule explicitly put in the reg text um, that you can take into account these preferences and it does not violate the duty of loyalty. So it's easier to take into account employees' preferences for ESG options under the Biden rule than under the Trump rule. Again, my takeaway, your mileage may vary, my takeaway is broadly similar between the two rules. So one law firm, I thought, helpfully summarized the, the Biden ESG rule as the final rule provides some comfort that ESG considerations are not off limits, but the underlying principle that risk and return cannot be sacrificed has not changed. I think that that's said very, very well. Um, ESG is not off limits. It wasn't off limits in the Trump rule, as I said, but there's some more comfort in the way the Biden rule stated it. But the underlying philosophy that this is really about you know, the long-term financial interests of your plan participants, their spouses, their families, that hasn't changed. That comes right from the statute. Um, there's not a safe harbor under the Biden rule that ERISA, sorry, that ESG investments are like kind of a, a separate category of assets that can, you know, have special privileges or at least special solicitude from, from the agency. Um, and here, this is, I, I think, a helpful way to think about it. Um, I'll return to this at, at the end, but under both rules, the Trump rule and, you know, that's now defunct and the, the current Biden rule, it's irrelevant to the fiduciary's analysis whether or not a particular factor or a particular investment has anything to do with E, S, or G. Um, the only time that is relevant under either rule is if you're in a tiebreaker situation. Again, this is tricky because as the Trump rule said, and the Biden rule certainly affirms, ESG can be a financial factor. It certainly could be the case that um, how much a company emits carbon could have an effect on the risk or the return of investing in that company. So it's not, there's not a clear line between the two. The point is whether or not the factor is ESG is just not important or relevant at all. And again, that's true for the Biden rule as it was true for the, the Trump ESG rule. Okay, it gets more interesting. Again, it used to be a regulatory ping pong. Now it's become a culture war ping pong and a, and a political ping pong. But um, just in the past two years, even in the past year, interest in ESG, controversy about ESG has really skyrocketed and it's found its way into, into our culture war, into the partisan divide of the country. And um, one way you see that is very recently, it was just the, the last week of January, 25 states, all led by Republicans, filed a lawsuit attacking the, the Biden ESG rule. And this is a, the first lawsuit of its kind. Um, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, the lawsuit claimed that the, the rule violates ERISA and um, exceeded the authority that the agency had to promulgate the rule under, under ERISA and uh, was arbitrary and capricious. The main substantive argument that the, the lawsuit makes goes to the tiebreaker rule that I talked about. Um, the lawsuit argues that by loosening the, the standard for when a fiduciary can, can break ties using an ESG factor, they basically authorized a regular violation um, of ERISA. 
um, the idea being, the theory being that it's sort of too easy and it, breaking the tie in a very strict literal sense, breaking the tie means you are not acting in total loyalty to your participants. You're, you're choosing to make a decision, in this case, break the tie with a factor that is for some other reason, because it's going to be good for the environment. It's good for racial diversity. So that's the main substantive argument. Um, just opining very casually. I, I, I think there's some merit to it. Uh, it's not it's not a crazy idea to say that the tiebreaker rule doesn't really make sense with a solely in the interest standard, exclusive purpose standard. <laughs> On the other hand, the tiebreaker rule has been around at least since 1994. Um, and it's to some extent, it's a concession to, you know, reality. It's it's not like there's a math formula or a computer program that can tell you which investment is the best. You know, there's a lot of just human frailty in trying to trying to do this marketing, excuse me, investing is, is never a science. Um, so I I mean I, I see why why it exists and whether or not a court or courts would would take the kind of aggressive view that the tiebreaker rule is not consistent with ERISA. I don't know. I don't think it's crazy, but I, I'm not neither am I confident that a court would rule that way. Um, Okay, more Republicans striking back. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the SEC is doing ESG stuff as well. Um, the two, the two um, Republican appointed commissioners have both expressed their own skepticism of ESG. Again, this is not a DOL or a risk related thing. I just am trying to illustrate to the extent that this has become a, a cultural battle and a political battle. Um, so just, just a few weeks ago, I think it was, yeah, it was the day after the, the lawsuit was filed, and and I, I don't think there was any coordination, but the the newest SEC commissioner, Mark Ueda, gave a speech that was that was fairly critical of the the Biden administration's ESG rule. Uh, and then two years prior, uh, the other current GOP appointed commissioner, Hester Pierce, in a very interesting speech, um, used the the idea of the scarlet letter, the the famous Nathaniel Hawthorne story. Um, kind of phrased ESG as scarlet letters. And I just want to read this, this line because it, it's, it's good writing and, and it's, you know, it's got some uh, interesting ideas to it. Um, so this is Commissioner Pierce writing, I think it was 2019, or speaking, it was a speech. We are seeing a similar scarlet letter phenomenon in today's modern but no less flawed world in the way in which corporations are being assessed according to environmental, social, governance factors. Here too, we see labeling based on incomplete information public shaming and shunning wrapped in moral rhetoric preached with cold-hearted self-righteous oblivion to the consequences, which ultimately fall on real people. In our purported, purportedly enlightened era, we pin scarlet letters on allegedly offending corporations without bothering much about facts and circumstances, and seemingly without caring about the unwarranted harm such labeling can engender. After all, naming and shaming corporate villains is fun, trendy, and profitable. Now, I think that's good writing, but I don't want to say I agree with their point or I disagree. My point is this is an example of a, a pretty pointed criticism of ESG from a fairly powerful Republican. Uh, and there's a lot more of this coming now that it's become such a live issue in, in the political wars. Other things I didn't put on the slide, but um, as of a few weeks ago, there's now caucuses in the House of Representatives. There's a, a pro-ESG caucus and an anti-ESG caucus. I forget the the names have given themselves. Um, so there's there's action in Congress as well. And then I thought this was a great map. This is from um, the law firm Ropes and Gray. I don't get any credit for it. And you don't need to really understand what all the colors mean. But basically, this map shows that two thirds of the states at some in the, at the state level, two thirds of the states have taken some action one way or the other on ESG. Um, so almost nobody or few, few states are standing on the sidelines now. It's just become whatever side you're on you're fighting. Um, and if you know Red and Blue America, ever seen those Red and Blue America maps, there's some overlay um, with this one. The states that are kind of more middle of the road, like my state, Michigan, they have not taken any action, but uh, Texas and the red states, Texas is leading the, the lawsuit I mentioned earlier. And then the, the blue states tend to be taking action on the other way. So it's just, it's kind of a mess. Okay. Can there be an ESG truce? This is this is a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, 
There could be, but based on what we've seen in the last year, the last two years, I don't see it happening anytime soon. I think this is going to be a pretty hot, hot issue. I don't know, at least through five, five years. So it, it makes it difficult for those of you who are just trying to do the work of managing your employees' retirements responsibly. Um, it doesn't make it impossible, but it's it's just a lot of background noise. Um, hopefully that's all it is, but but there's a lot going on, and I, I don't see it dying down anytime soon. It does, certainly on the Republican side, it taps into a lot of the Republican id about, you know, how corporate America is trying to, you know, subtly work their will. You see the phrase woke investing. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of momentum on that side. Obviously, for the, the Democrats, ESG investing, at least for those of those of the, the Democrats who believe in a kind of a, a true do-good investing, not just using ESG as a, a more financially sophisticated way to make money, but a way to you know make some money and also help the earth. They're very invested in ESG as well. Okay, things to look out for. I, I really think this, this lawsuit that was filed at the end of January could be very important. A lot depends on what happens, obviously. But one thing that could happen is the lawsuit could end up going all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court could issue a ruling that basically puts to the end this regulatory ping pong and now this rulemaking ping pong that we've seen since at least since 1994. I mean, if the if the Supreme Court decides that ERISA does not allow the tiebreaker rule, that is inconsistent for there ever to be a non-financial factor to break a tie or to do anything in the mind of a, an ERISA fiduciary, that, that's, that's the end of anything that the Department of Labor will do. Um, any, any further change would have to come from Congress. So I think that is a very important thing to watch in terms of what, what's going to happen going forward and, and maybe put an end to this ping pong. Um, as I said, Congress could also act, and there has been some move. I think there are bills on both sides of the issue that have been introduced. I, I don't know if any of them could pass at the any time soon, but that that could happen depending on how elections go. We could have, you know, a Republican-controlled Congress pass a law that just makes it absolutely explicit that um, you can't consider non-financial factors if you're an ERISA fiduciary, or you could have a you know, a Democratic controlled Congress pass a law saying the opposite, that you're required to consider ESG factors to be a responsible fiduciary under ERISA. So other things to watch. Okay. These are my thoughts. These are my general ideas of what I think fiduciaries should do. I don't know how many of you on the call are fiduciaries or advise fiduciaries. Uh, and this is this is being conservative, not conservative in the political sense, conservative in the, in the uh, legal sense, risk averse. I think the, the safest thing to do if you are a fiduciary is to just ignore ESG. And I don't mean that me, I don't mean that you never look at an ESG investment or an ESG fund. I mean, erase from your mind, and I know this is impossible in, in, a, in a normal sense, but erase from your mind whatever claims or lack of claims an, an investment a company is making in terms of ESG and only look at an investment as a, at a potential fund to be added to your menu, only look at it from a financial perspective. So it doesn't matter if company X is emitting this much carbon and it puts them on a list of you know bad emitters, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is the fact that the company emits so much carbon make it any more of a risky investment. And if, if it makes it more of a risky investment, then consider that. But just ignore any of the environmental, social, or governance components to a particular investment. Um, I'm, I'm gonna quote, this is from the introduction to the Trump ESG rule. I think it summarizes how I think a, a risk averse fiduciary would, should proceed. From a fiduciary perspective, the relevant question is not whether a factor under consideration is ESG or ES or G, I mean, it's, it's an aggregation but whether it is a pecuniary factor relevant to, the, to an evaluation of the investment under consideration. So again, the, the ESG nature or lack thereof of any particular investment is just, I would say, not relevant and just ignore it. That is, that is the safest way forward. Uh, following from that, I would recommend, I would advise not relying on the tiebreaker rule. Um, just not ever, 
making a decision based on a non-financial factor, a factor that's not related to risk and return. Um, and I, I get, I mean, ties are real. We're not, we're not robots. Just do the best you can. And if you do the best you can, that is all Arisa ever asks you to do. And uh, last, make sure that when you're doing the best that you can, you document why you made that decision, what you considered, why you chose one over the other, um, just in case if the Department of Labor comes knocking, you can show them, yeah, I wasn't trying to, you know, help this or that policy goal or environmental goal. I was just trying to make the most money for my participants, make sure their investments are secure. Um, I know this is a very big overview, this is very high level. These kinds of questions are very detailed. Um, if the questions arise that are more detailed, please reach out to your attorney. Don't, don't try to wing it. I'm very, very happy to answer questions. We have other people at Miller Johnson that are very, very good at answering these questions, but don't hesitate if this gets tricky. Um, and unfortunately, it, it does often get tricky. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I don't see any more questions. And again, love to help if you guys uh, would like some help. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much.